I like uh, the theme that you've chosen, Nectesis, transformation, because our time, the time that we're living in, grab that balloon, uh, is really one of very, very significant transformation. We're living in a time where transformations are not only happening, they're happening rapidly and radically. And if you look at any sphere of your life, whether it is the digitalization, your whole workplace concept has changed. The work, you don't go to work, the work comes to you, or you take the work. You're looking at artificial intelligence, which is now really turning scary. I don't know how many of you have seen a comment made by Elon Musk, who's a big player in, in artificial intelligence. Uh, in which he says that his biggest nightmare is that huge armies of bots will annihilate the human race. And this is somebody who is working in artificial intelligence and he uh, is very state of the art. So we are living in a time where technology is playing an extremely large and significant role. But I want to talk today about uh, one aspect or one, one series of technologies, and that is in the field of biology. Because the 21st century is undoubtedly the century of biology. And all the radical breakthroughs that are happening, all the great transformations that are happening, are happening in the field of biology. You might say that artificial intelligence is a challenge. Let me explain what I mean by the biggest, most dramatic, most radical changes, or the biggest, most dramatic, most radical uh, technologies that are transformative. No other technology reproduces. There is no technology that will give birth to the next generation and the next generation on its own. You can take a robot and sit it in a room. It's going to sit there. It's not going to make baby robots. So it will not reproduce. The technology does not have the capacity to reproduce. But biological technologies have the capacity to reproduce. If you stick a genetically engineered organism or a genetically engineered cell in a dish in a room, it's not just going to sit there. It's going to do its own stuff. It's going to reproduce, and it's going to spread, which is why the most transformative technologies are happening in biology. So we were really thinking that when genetic engineering happened, the world is talking about GM crops. So when genetic engineering happened, this was very radical, and it is. It is radical, and for 20 years or so, uh, we talked about this really fierce technology in biology of genetic engineering. And look at what's happened in these last 10 years. If you see the world of biology in transformational technologies in these last 10 years, it's exploded. In genetic engineering, you had this whole development of CRISPR. CRISPR is this technology which does even allegedly more accurate genetic engineering. It doesn't do uh, an approximate thing, it does a very precise thing of shifting genes, of putting in genes, of correcting genes. And now we have this big promise of correcting genes. So people who deal with genetic disorders, genetic diseases, diseases that are inherited and cannot be cured, they place this great hope. The reason I'm emphasizing the whole radical, transformative, and pushing the envelope nature of these technologies is to bring to your attention what these technologies do and the question of safety and security that arises with, the, with these technologies. And I'm going to talk specifically about synthetic biology. Because here is one set of technologies that have developed in a way that you're working with natural systems. You're tinkering with natural systems, but you're working within a system of biological cells, genes, chromosomes that exist in the natural world. Synthetic biology passes that. It breaks that barrier and moves beyond. 
and how does it do that and what is synthetic biology? Synthetic biology really is that interface between biology and engineering which makes it a bit scary because you're breaking biological boundaries and you're moving into realms that are very novel and in the novelty itself is the risk. So you have these technologies and particularly synthetic biology which is a technology of exciting promises, no question. Exciting things can be done but also of very dangerous capabilities. And these dangerous capabilities are what we tend to forget when we are looking at the excitement and the promise. And I think as all of us, and particularly you people as engineering students and technical people, must keep in mind that when you're looking at, at these radical transformations, at these systems of ecstasy that is happening in many, many sectors, that there is, the more radical, the higher the risk. And that you have to pay attention to addressing that risk. Um, I'd like to go into synthetic biology for a bit because I think that really wild stuff is happening there. It's like in using your idiom, um, like you write a code in software to create an app. Now in biology we can write codes to create new organisms. And so it is really the interface between engineering and, and uh, biological systems. What is synthetic biology being used for? And, or let me tell you, what, how did synthetic biology start? The first thing was you stripped a bacterium, which is one of, the, one of the simplest life forms. You stripped it, you took out all its genetic material and you put another genet set of genetic material in that. And you created a new organism. The next step was you stripped it and you synthesized new DNA. You synthesize new DNA from chemicals that are available on the market. So you can go shopping, you can buy all of this chemical stuff, and you can make it in your living room. That's how easy it is now, technically, to do it. But what happens when you do that? And this is being done. Uh, let me tell you about the promises. Promises are, for example, DNA is now being used for data storage. We are generating reams of data in every field of technology and data analytics has therefore become a field in itself because you don't know how to, how to analyze uh, all of those numbers and figures and data that you're, that you're generating. So where is this data to be stored? The Microsoft, in fact, is doing this already, creating synthetic DNA as storage, because DNA is one of the densest forms of storage. You can pack huge amounts of data into little pieces of DNA. So this is becoming now this great big data storage site. And you're synthesizing a living system. DNA is a living system. It will reproduce. Or you're using it to make chemicals, plastics, biofuels, because you engineer organisms in the way that you want. You create genes that will produce, say, a biofuel, and you put it out there to produce biofuels. Uh, or you can use it in agriculture. There are people who are trying to create fertilizers out of the nitrogen in the air. Or you can use it in, in diseases and in, in tackling, for example, antibiotic resistance, etc. Now, when we are doing all this, this is the exciting promises part of it. And what, is, what are the dangerous capabilities that we are engendering, uh, really al almost without regulation? What those are is the creation of new life forms. And just like you might want to make biofuels, I might be a bioterrorist, and I might want to make organisms that are killing organisms, that are organisms that can be spread into, into regions as an aerosol, for example, just push it out of great big dispensers and you have poliovirus or you have anthrax or you have something else. Now, we have dealt with bioterrorism and security agencies continue to deal with bioterrorism. The thing is that when you create a new organism, you don't know how to deal with it. 
So we've had an anthrax scare some 10 years ago. Do you remember letter, letter bombs went out with anthrax and stuff? You know anthrax. You know that. And you also know how you can create an antidote because you and the anthrax have evolved together. So there's a pedigree. Any organism that exists, even if you want to use it as a uh, agent of bio-warfare, you know that organism and you can actually deal with it because you can find an antidote. There is a genetic footprint that you can find and that is mostly known. But when you create a new organism, a synthetic organism, there is no pedigree, there is no footprint, there is no coevolution. It's a terrifyingly dangerous organism out there that you don't know how to deal with. And that is the dangerous capability that I'm talking about. That is what can happen. You can deal with an anthrax scare of a normal anthrax, an anthrax that has co-evolved. But you don't know how to deal with a malevolent organism, bacteria or virus that has been synthesized in the lab. You don't know how to deal with it because there is no commonality in your footprints. And that is the brave new world of science that we have to be very, very afraid of. So the question is that do you stop science? No, of course not. And there's, there's no way of stopping science. You'll always have the maverick who'll do something. And to talk about synthetic biology, or when we started with genetic engineering, the scientists put their heads together and said, look, there is this exciting promise, but this is the, the dangerous capability that has been in, engendered. Let us have regulation. So yes, the no-brainer is that you must regulate these technologies. You have to regulate these technologies. Otherwise, everybody, his dog and his brother, will be out there synthesizing stuff in the garage and pooch with the human race before you know what's happening. Not that that would be a bad idea. But uh, talking in terms of being a responsible scientific community or a policy body that needs to look at this kind of scientific development, what should you be doing? You should be looking at the safety and security aspects of it. You don't really have to be worried about bots because they don't reproduce. But you have to be seriously worried about synthetic biology because it will reproduce and it will go out of control. So safety systems at the level of the biology itself, you do these experiments in a contained atmosphere and in a lab that is level 3, level 4 labs in terms of security. And you have to have regulation at the level of policy. We will do this, we will not do that. This is who is going to be able to do it. You need these, these, these qualifications to be able to work in a lab like that. But do we really follow them? And I put it to you because I think all people who deal with technologies, who study them, need to be very, very conscious of the terrain that we have already entered. Talking about synthetic biology, while the United States, which is a leader in this technology, as in many other of the new technologies, while they are developing and trying to develop frameworks for regulation and security, it turns out that the Russians had a clandestine program, very, very far evolved, in which they were streets ahead. I mean, we undermine uh, our, our intelligence and capacity when we when we do not take into account the kind of work that is happening in, in societies that are not as open, which includes China and Russia, these are for heaven's sake no political statements, but these are systems where uh, oversight has not always been as transparent as in many other systems. And therefore, not surprisingly, you had in Russia, you had this whole clandestine synthetic biology program that was going on with the intention of bio-welfare. The intention was to create malevolent organisms, bacteria, virus, so that if push came to shove, you were able to use this as, as an extremely powerful uh, attack option against your adversary, in this case, the United States. Uh, as far as genetic engineering and what is now increasingly being called extreme genetic engineering is concerned, um, there have been certain governance between scientists. Scientists have agreed 
we will not do this. For example, we will not, I mean geneticists and people like me who are trained in both human genetics, there is a covenant that you will not tamper with the germ line. That means you will not do between the female reproductive cell and the, and the sperm, the egg and the sperm, you will not tamper with these so that you don't ultimately tamper with the human race. This is an unwritten thing. It's also written though, by the way. And it is that you will do research on, on stages beyond that, but you will not do research of genetic manipulation on uh, genetic cells, which, is, uh, which are reproductive. That means the female egg and the male sperm. And guess what? This has been going on in China. And uh, there is evidence that human embryos have been created through this kind of manipulation where you've tried to make perfect human beings or human beings with certain traits, big muscles, etc. Um, and how much of it is true, I don't know, but there is co evidence coming out of labs that this kind of research is being done. So uh, without creating scary monsters, uh, or, or let me take that back, with the intention of creating scary monsters, let me tell this audience and urge you to talk about this and to write about this, that whereas transformative technologies can be extremely powerful tools to address many of the challenges that we have created for ourselves. I mean, we humans have successfully created such appalling challenges uh, for ourselves, environmental degradation, the, the, crea the, the birth of new diseases because of the uh, biological environments that you've created and the, and the rate of um, mutations that have gone up and created worse and worse kinds of viruses and bacteria, creating diseases we don't know how to control, that in our efforts to tackle these problems that we've created, let us be very, very careful in evaluating the solutions that we are trying to, prove, to put onto the market. And I will end the, this with saying that there is a word, there is a phrase in science called the precautionary principle. So along with regulation and, and an awareness about safety and security in the field of biological technologies is also what is called common good sense. There are certain things that can be so potentially dangerous that you invoke the precautionary principle and you say this is perhaps best left alone and let us look at another kind of solution that may be more benign. Thank you.